Salutations, my friends, and welcome back to TNO, the last days of Europe, in which we were playing as America last time. I can't remember what happened. We still have Tricky Dick as our president, but we had a couple issues. Things were going great. Things aren't going so great. The Senate is still controlled by the Republican Democrat Party, but we've just sent volunteers down to South Africa because they're not having a good time. I've already begun sending planes down here, 180 in total. Right now, we can only send one division, though, but we're laying the groundwork. Democracy in Africa has been but a faint memory dating back to before the Second World War. Colonial empires introduced the concept to the natives, but these empires have since fallen under Nazi rule. Our last hope for democracy on the continent lies in the Republic of South Africa. We form the OFN in order to protect these frail democracies, and we must take action against advancing Germans if South Africa is to survive. Unfortunately, though, our allies in the OFN are currently preoccupied as Canada prepares to help democracy win out in England. This war has proved or provided us a great opportunity to take the world's stage from the fascists. We have to form a united front if we're to assist our South African allies, and to do this, we've decided to hold an OFN summit. We must gather every democratic leader to discuss our strategy heading into the conflict. We must show the world that the OFN is dedicated to the cause of freedom. We need to rally the OFN. We're going to do a whole bunch of stuff here. There's a couple of comments from yesterday, including that we should probably back the English, or the Himmler's resistance. Uh, they're not looking too good right now. Um... We could, reaching out and establishing communications could do great things. Uh, I'll be honest, I did play this a little bit off screen. Just Actually, I got all the way to like 1970, just to see what would happen if I chose certain paths. Uh, so, even if we don't help them, that's still okay. Uh, I do know I need to save political power, because there's, there's so many things we need to spend political power on right now. But I know you guys want me to, but I think I'm going to leave it out, because even if the government does win, there's a chance that uh, they'll still like us, and actually... Uh, there's a way to influence the government if they still win. So I don't think they'll win here. I think it's too late to help them out, but I think we'll still do okay without them. We're going to increase party unity. It is 63. We could do the South African War, which will hurt our discontent with the public. And we can do stuff down here, but I don't really want to do that. If I do ex exp greatly expand ground operations, that does increase like the far right of the NPP, apparently. So we're not going to do that. I don't mind doing a few of these, but I don't know. We'll see what happens. Uh, start of businesses, our reserves, our GDP growth. You know what? I said I don't want to spend any political power. Let's get some more GDP. Because the way I saw things, we're going to do pretty well. We have a pretty good deficit. I'm going to increase spending, though. Just because I want more political power from that. And secondly, we can build things even faster now. And I might actually lower construction, construction spending as well. So, uh, cool. One, two, three, four, five, somewhat ish. So, keep building for now. That's the main plan. And I've sent over one division of air... Well, troopers. Alright, so we're still playing as Tricky Dick. And we have our sacred duty. The Organization of Free Nations has created to aid the last remaining democracies on Earth. And the frail democracy in South Africa needs our help. With the German invasion looming on the horizon, we need to ensure support for the nation so that they do not succumb to the Reich. The time is running out for this final beacon of democracy in Africa. Which we cannot do this or this anymore. It's unfortunate. But oh well, our sacred duty. And now we can go back and do the next one. Kickstart the media. Times have changed, and in our new American society, the president does not have as much influence over his people as he would like. We need to get our message out to the media to guarantee public support for the upcoming struggle. Our people need to know that we are defending a weak democracy that currently stands alone against the looming Nazi presence. We will have the newspapers printing propaganda every day if it means we will garner public support. Which would be a great thing. Americans on a hijacked Iberian ship. Oh no, news today reached offices of the Pentagon of a crisis upon the seas. The Iberian government, as well as West Indies Federation, reported a hijacked passenger ship known as the Santa Maria. The ship was given was days ago hijacked by a group of radical Iberian Democrats who boarded disguised as passengers and has since gone off the radar following a quick stop in St. Kitts, in which crewmen injured in the hijacking were offloaded. Aboard the ship are 600 passengers consisting of women, children, and civilian men. Many of these aboard those ships are Iberian. However, the Pentagon confirms that several occupants are American citizens. It is possible that all those aboard the ship can meet a violent end, should all go awry, which would include the death of several American citizens at the hands of foreign terrorists. The American public would find such news unacceptable. As such, the only advisable course of action would be to commence a naval search operation to find the Santa Maria and to liberate those on board. There are several United States Navy vessels in the Caribbean and Central Electric Atlantic region which are prepared to commence search operations upon a moment's notice. Send in the Navy, my friends! As we have a nice sip of water, and maybe have a drink of our coffee here. Ooh, National Liberation Front 1. So the fall of Blom Blomfontein. Perhaps the board should prepare a little bit more for the Civil War they started. And now that they 
now that has denigrated into a proxy war for African supremacy between the Africa Shield and the OFM. Situated very close to the initial front lines of the war, Blomfontein, capital of the newly established Boer Republic, has little time to prepare. Despite the efforts of the garrison commander, lack of manpower and materials due to the poor industrial development of the region meant that only makeshift defenses, mainly a few prefabricated bunkers, trenches, and anti-aircraft batteries scattered throughout the outskirts, could be erected in time for the South African offensive. Despite a fierce resistance, the city garrison couldn't repel the attackers and was soon forced to retreat inwards. Emergency barricades were built by auxiliaries and several buildings were booby-trapped or set on fire to slow down the foe, but in the end it wasn't enough. After a brief last stand in the town hall, the officer in the command of the city agreed to the surrender terms offered by the Federation. The civilian irregulars were disarmed and allowed to return to their families, while all others were taken prisoners. Even though the government evacuated the city long before the offensive began due to safety reasons, the fall of Bloemfontein is still a hard blow to the cause of the Boers. Morale is falling all throughout the insurgent forces, and now many have begun to question their German allies, and this is how the war is turning out to be, then it may not be long before peace returns, and yet this war will continue to go on, and we get more political power, because there's going to be a time here soon that we're going to lose a lot of political power, but we're also going to gain a lot of political power as well, so I could do stuff here, but I don't really feel like it. Political power, I'm, I, I don't know exactly how much political power we're going to need, but in my mind, I'm just going to save as much as I can. It really doesn't matter, in my mind. The way we want to go, doesn't matter. Really doesn't matter. Uh, just save it up, Earl Wheeler. He's offensive. Organization reinforce rate. Uh, I want to get... Um, I like the recovery rate. Let's go organization first. Ah, screw it, we'll do both. If we can do that both, that's great. So what we're going to do, we're going to come over here and kill off these guys because we can. Now, here's a plan. It is 63, it's almost 64. Next year is an election year. And we are bombing people pretty, pretty uh, nicely, actually, over here. Uh, yeah, we're doing quite a bit of air damage, or ground support, actually, I should, I should really say. 5.8 is not bad, so kickstart the media. Uh, let's see, we don't want to win before Tricky Dick does something, but let's get some emergency support. We're quickly losing ground in South Africa. The situation is worsened to the point where we may not see South Africa in the upcoming OFN summit. It is imperative that we provide South Africa with an emergency shipment of equipment to ensure that they will hold on until we can get our own troops to the battlefield. We must act fast, the democracy is struggling to stand. Well, I don't know about that, and we also are using these air choppers, so scout helicopters not so much, but these guys transport helicopters. Pretty nice, actually. Pretty darn nice. So, one, two, three, four, five. Uh, you know what? I'm actually going to go build up some more military factories right now. Build them in... Mm, Georgia? Mississippi. Well, I should probably focus a little bit more on places that do not have infrastructure needs immediately. You know what? We're going to wait then. It's fine. Because these guys move fast. Holy crap, Ola. They move extraordinarily fast, but kickstart the medium. This is 7 o'clock evening news. Tonight's top story, the shocking images coming from the Nazi invasion of South Africa, the last democracy on the continent. In millions of households across America, the exact same story was being aired from every single radio and television station as agreed at a high-level meeting between the media executives and Nixon administration. We face a desperate struggle, a struggle for the survival of freedom in the face of Nazi tyranny. The Americans must know that in the face of totalitarian aggression, there can be no compromise. A haggard Prime Minister, Sir de Villiers, Graf of South Africa, has made a desperate plea for international intervention to the hearts of Americans. A snide question asking if said freedom extended to the Africans was edited out, of course. By God, Walter can't say this one out. We lost the last war, but not for the lack of trying. What did Shakespeare say? A coward dies a thousand deaths. The assembled panelists all nodded in agreement. The city had been careful to vet everyone beforehand. There would be no peaceniks on the airwaves today and tomorrow and the day after. It's just a war. Everyone says so. Cool. And the Marine Raiders. Ooh. Corporal Smithley is the last in his squad to climb aboard the Santa Maria under the co cover of nightfall. He carefully unslings his M14 rifle from his back, and as quietly as possible does a check of his unloaded magazine, and ensures a round is ready prepared, readily prepared within the chamber. The intent of the mission is clear. Act fast, ensure civilians are not harmed, and take prisoner as many of the hijackers as possible. As soon as the first shot is fired, the hijackers will mobilize. The squad labor gives a short series of hand signals, and they begin to move slowly across the dimly lit deck of the ship. Not long after, contact is made. The squad leader quickly releases two shots into the armed hijacker patrolling the deck, and the hijacker goes limp. Now that the shots have been fired, the marines spring into action. Shots ring out from the other side of the deck as the other hijackers are likely killed. Smithley accompanies his squad in climbing an outer staircase of the ship as they prepare for the close quarters combat upon entering the bridge. The order is given to fix bayonets, and Smithley quickly fixes the ring bayonet to the socket upon the barrel. Commotion can now be heard from within the ship as several men begin shouting. Gunshots can be heard from the other areas of the ship as other marine squads quickly dispatch the oddly displaced and unprepared hijackers. Smithley's squad quickly arrives at the entrance to the bridge from where the ship is controlled. The squad leader begins counting down the entry. Finally, the count's at one, and he springs into action along with the rest of his squad. Quickly, they rush into the bridge. Smithley, without thinking, dispatches one armed defender before a shot is fired. The other armed men within the bridge drop their rifles and swiftly surrender to preserve their own life. We have Galveo. The ship is secure. Man, you know what? I would love to see if that was made into a movie. That'd be so cool. 
even though that is kind of like a movie like that. I forget what it's called, like when Somali pirates hijacked an American vessel, but that sounds so cool. I'm sorry, it's just I think that'd be cool if it, was a, if it was a movie, but hey, man. TNO movies when? Please? Please? Oh, God, please. Don't tease me with such a good time. Let's go and get rid of these divisions. And the gun. These, look at the speed. 39.5. Jesus Christ, that is so good. Especially when you have air superiority, don't get me wrong. But, military austerity. Um, eh, we don't need we don't need that bonus to attack. We can take a hit to our attack and defense for now. If we can move here fast enough, we can encircle these guys, but probably not. And we are getting some support, so we'll see what happens. Come on. African National Congress has got to go bye-bye. Emergency support. Great. And we fight for freedom. We've been looking at ways to best get in touch with the public surrounding the South African War. We must remind our citizens that we, too, fought against oppression in the Revolutionary War that brought us into existence many years ago. Right now, Nazi Germany is looking to destroy the liberties that South Africans hold dear. The very same liberties that we held back in 1776. We fought for freedom, and we promised to help the South Africans fight for their freedom as well. God dang it, we didn't get there in time. That's okay. Just beat the snot out of them. That's all we care about. Cool. 448, not bad. My goal isn't to get a super high GDP. My goal is just to get... A higher or lower the debt early. Cool. Death of a Supreme Court justice. Sad news coming from over the wires. One of the senior most justices on the U.S. Supreme Court has passed away. A conservative, they wrote, several notable opinions throughout their tenure, both concurring and dissenting. In addition, they were swing they were the swing justice in more than one case. However, with a solemn moment comes an opportunity to change the balance of the highest court in the land. We'll have to get the right nominee and manage the Senate process carefully. But if we, if we if we succeed, it'll be a major victory for our administration. Let's fill this vacancy. And to do this, I already know that we have to choose. Uh, can I change it? Not yet. State of the Supreme Court. Oh, the fall of Blumenfalten. Oh, we've already read this, so. And the uh, war goes on. We're doing really well. Oh, wait. Did I click on that? Oh, wait. Return. Oh, well. Liberations. I'm not going to read that. We already liberated it or whatever. Uh, I just want to... Supreme Court Justice? Oh, we'll see. We'll get, probably get an event for that. Just move straight on in. Like, they're so fast. This is, the, this is so awesome. Algerian crest is defused. Cool. At least nobody was shooting each other for now. Do anything here? Yes. Not that much, but that's okay. This is all for a good cause. Let these guys get a, get out of Johannesburg. We fight for freedom. And then we have some air assault. Three. Great. Uh, extract a, exaggerate boar atrocities. Oh. Overall, it seems like the American public is still adamant in the pacifist beliefs. Even if the war is only a regional conflict, our folks at home are not very happy about another war in a foreign land. We've been picking up reports of German crimes being committed in South Africa. If we exaggerate these details enough, we may be able to get the support we need. We must magnify German cruelty in order to ensure that all Americans strongly oppose the very enemies we are fighting. Cool. When does the media lie about anything? Uh, you know what? If we're on defense, I much prefer being on defense than attack because it's usually easier to defend, but... And this gives us, I guess, technically more army XP, even though we're losing more every day. But this, it gives us, or gives our guy, more experience for himself. So, Lavelle, hope you're learning a lot. Hope you're doing well. And we won. Oh, wait, whoops, my bad. We still research, my bad. I let a couple days go without doing that. Completely my fault. Uh, let's go ahead and do Marines. Are these considered special forces? I'm going to see if they are. Yes, they are. They are considered special forces. That is awesome. Make sure they're high. Well, not high, but they have prioritized equipment. And Signal Company 3 is even more initiative. That'd be great. Can we defend even more? Yes, we can. Exaggerate more atrocities. We're going to rally the Canadians. Even though the Canada Canadians are preparing to help the rightful English ruler retake London, they're still committed to the OFM. As such, they're obliged to give us much-needed assistance in our African war against the Germans. We should call upon our Canadian allies, and who knows? We might be able to give them more money in exchange. Maybe. And reports of Boer atrocities cover the front pages. Desmond, an active construction worker in New York City, has to a grocery store to pick up the latest edition of the New York Times. He has a long conversation with a co-worker about the South African War and his conflict it was still fresh in his mind as he left for work today. Or left work today. The man selected his copy from the grocery store counter and opened it, finding today's headlines, or leading headline, in bold. War in South Africa rages on. Ever since war broke out between the Reich's commissars and the Republic, Desmond quickly, publicly showed his strong opposition. When he was not working, he could be seen at anti-war protests throughout New York City. He began reading about the recent German offenses rippling through the South African heartland and wondered why he was paying taxes to support such a pointless war. Once he reached the bottom of the article, a new bold headline appeared directly under it. Boer massacres take hundreds of lives. Desmond couldn't believe what he was reading in the article. The Boers, supported by Germany, were brutally raping, enslaving, and killing women and children. Hopefully they're not raping children, but you know, whatever. At least 500 individuals suffered at the hands of the invading party, and the war was only just beginning. It was then that Desmond really saw the scope of the war and why it was so necessary for Americans to get involved. Innocent, unarmed human lives were at stake. The man imagined what could have happened if his wife, daughter, and son were victims of the Boer atrocities. As he gave the cashier a handful of coins, began to con contemplate whether he can really support the war effort. The Boers are not nice right now. 
Ah. I love propaganda. Cool. Can we actually move fast enough so we can go over here just encircle these guys? Cut off the capital? Probably, actually. Yes. You know, hold for now since they're not moving. Okay, and now move over here. Okay, we've completely encircled the capital. Uh, actually, I need to slow this down because we're doing too well right now. We're actually doing too well. We do not want to win this war before uh, things go poorly for us, so... I'm not gonna. I'm just gonna hang out down here. Actually, what we're gonna do, just in case, I'm gonna land in Cape Town and hold that area because the Germans usually like to invade that area. But happy 1964, my friends. Let's call them the Pacific. Australia needs us as much as we need them for the war effort. We need. We just need to let the Australians know that we're watching their Pacific territories and they will want in our little war. We must ring up the Prime Minister and get him on our side as soon as possible. Yeah, we're doing too well. The Battle of Johannesburg. The newly christened Johannesburg, formerly Johannesburg. Uh, when the city was still a part of the South African Federation has been captured by advancing federal troops. As the war entered its acute phase with German and American troops fighting each other directly, the Boers found themselves at the proverbial clay pot between the Iron Ones. The newly established Boer Republic was immediately invaded, and despite the trickle of supplies from the shield, the Federation was able to break through the border defenses and pu directly push for Johannesburg in the effort to force the insurgent state to capitulate. As the second most populous city in all of South Africa, Johannesburg was he heavily garrisoned and protected, but it proved to be too little to stop the advancing attackers. The fortifications were torn down by heavy bombings, which were immediately followed by a general offensive. Despite the valiant efforts of the Boer soldiers, they couldn't resist the impetus, and were forced back to the city center. There, they found many defensive positions sabotaged by the ANC partisans, which eventually forced the commander to surrender. With the fall of Johannesburg, the Boers have lost not only their largest settlement, but also their only developed industrial sector, effectively crippling their war production. This will make it much more difficult for them to keep fighting effectively, and many agree that this might be the beginning of the end for the ill-fated uprising. Oh, it is. Oh, it definitely will be. But I'm done. Savalani. Bennett was a patient man, but even he was beginning to grow frustrated. I've heard that Bennett, if you want him as president, he focuses on the economy quite a bit. So, it's really quite simple, Mr. Johnson. The American currency is over-reliant on the silver standard. What I'm proposing is really not that radical. All the Silver Act suggests is that we reduce the reliance both within the federal budget and in the private sector. This was perhaps the third time we had explained this simple concept to the assembled senators, and many were listening intently, but LBJ, Lyndon Baines Johnson, had chosen to enact his charismatic, bullish persona to derail the, con the discussion. And I also say it's pretty simple, that you are wasting time arguing over which metal we base our currency on. Last I checked, America was still an economic giant by all accounts, so I really fail to see the merit of this passion project of yours. Johnson scoffed as he leaned informally against his desk, and Bennett felt his blood pressure steadily rise at the back, lack of respect. We can be so much stronger, though, Mr. Johnson. Myself and my colleagues have done much research into the matter. We haven't even begun to get into the hard data. Allow me to show you the charts. I will gladly look at your graphs, Mr. Bennett, but given the times we live in, I can still say that silver is rather a small thing to get worked up over. Johnson chuckled idly as Bennett launched into more discussion, clearly not listening. Belittling as, belittling as always, thought Bennett. Johnson was supposed to be his ally. The Republicans and Democrats were supposed to be allies, yet the center and right NPP seem to have a better and more equal relationship than the two sides of the party did these days. As a Democrat, Bennett felt increasingly sidelined. That would have to change, he cited then and there. After the ultimately fruitless discussion came to a close, the two men passed each other as the senators left the hall for lunch. Bennett fixed Johnson with a steely glare, his mild-mannered persona could muster. Something's got to change around, Johnson, and I'm going to be the one to do something about it. Something's got to give. <sighs> Everyone's pissed off at each other. Don't you love it when that happens? Everyone's just pissed off at each other. I mean, these guys are doing great. It, I'll be honest here with this war in South Africa. Actually, last time, we got Republican Madagascar with us, as well as the Jewish. Well, the Jewish Madagascar is looking really cool. But we also have this part of South Africa under us, too, which is awesome. All right, just war. Our mission for this campaign is set in stone. As a leader of the OFN, we will fight to ensure that all democracies stand and the freedom bell rings across every continent. We will fight to preserve liberty in South Africa, and we will stand for nothing less. If we can pull this off, we will certainly have an established power base in Africa. Yeah, I'm going to go all the way. I'm taking out all of this territory. I promise you that. Because I actually did that before, and it's not that difficult. So, ah, the presidential election season has begun. The primaries are concluded. The conventions are now over. And the battle between the chosen candidates of the Republic Democrats and the National Progressive Party will begin in earnest. While every electoral race, from county com commissars to state judges to the Senate in Washington, are, is important, none of them can compare that to the drama, pageantry, and scale of the presidential race that spans the whole country. Unlike many nations in the world where leaders are determined behind closed doors or in bloody coups and civil wars, every four years is that citizens of America get to change the course of their nation in a peaceful transition that goes right back to George Washington in 1789. Many important issues of the day will be debated, from taxes to foreign policy, from infrastructure to welfare. But more and more, the personality of the candidate is what's important. Who is the charmer? Who is more charismatic? Who is the one that makes the voter truly feel that they hear them? And who will fight for them? The polls, televised debates, newspaper interviews, and speeches around the nation will help the undecided voter make their choice, while reinforcing the partisans in theirs. The race has begun. It's a long way to November. Class 1 Senate election season. The U.S. is once again gearing up for election season. As per the Constitution, all seats in the House of Representatives and the third of the Senate seats will be up for grabs in November, along with innumerable state and local races across the nation. And the course of American politics.
politics will change with it. Status quo, radical people, it's time for people to decide. The Republican, Democrats, and the NPP, along with numerous third parties, are gearing up their political machines across 50 states. Well, maybe except for Hawaii, with a special focus on going to the Senate seats up for grabs. Tens of thousands of volunteers, campaign staff, and candidates are gearing up to begin the primaries, rallies, whistle-stop tours, public speeches, glad-handing, and debates that will dominate the nation's attention for the next few months. Issues of great importance will be debated, candidates will be scrutinized, and eventually millions of voters around the nation will get the chance to make their voices heard, or not heard if they don't want to. And the greatest democracy in the world will once again prove itself. We're a democracy? Really? I don't know. I don't think we directly elect our uh, people here, but I don't know. We'll see what happens. Uh, keep America free, strong and free. Vote R&D. Fighting for you and me. Help me elect the NPP. Uh, let's go with that one. Because, <clears throat> like I said last time, I want to get RFK. And let's see. Actually, we want the NPP to win in this election, which means I should probably actually increase discontent here, too, some more. So, East Coast. We might do East Coast. East Coast, Southwest... Great Plains. East Coast, Southwest, uh, Great Plains. Let's do East Coast first. Central East Coast. Hey, we'll do that one. Why not? Operation Rolling Thunder. So let's go ahead and increase public discontent with the war for now. Just because I think it'll, it'll help us out. Uh, discontent with the war will rise. I don't want to spend political power, but we need to. So. Very low. The more discontent for the war there is, the better the chance that we might lose a leader. Wink, wink, and nudge, nudge. So, it's not much to cut off the debt, but that's okay. Hey, look at that. Since we increase our spending and, and business ties with India, instead of 3.9%, we have 4.2. Ah, blazing. Choosing our Scottish nominee. So, at the moment, the Supreme Court is very conservative. Many in both the media and the Congress are urging us to select a nominee who would provide some ideological balance. The Supreme Court is ostensibly supposed to be nonpartisan and keep kept away from petty day to day politics. On the other hand, very few things in America are nonpartisan when you get right down to it. Picking a nominee who fits with our ideological outlook can ensure some real political victories down the line, yet, on the other hand, it could draw the ire of those who, don't, who aren't staunch members of our voting base. So, which option should we go with? A liberal nominee or a conservative one? Well, according to my notes here, and the way we want to go, we, unfortunately, have to not choose liberal, but we have to go with a conservative dude. But we have the Pearl Harbor Monument. Two, pre the previous two decades have been rough on the U.S. Being on the losing end of the Second World War, giving up key ports in California to the enemy, watching Europe and Russia fall to the jackboot, utterly powerless. Worst of all, our own red-blooded Americans were struck by the most powerful weapon in the world has ever seen. Twenty years ago today, Pearl Harbor was destroyed, wiped from the face of Earth by the atomic bomb. December 7th, 1941 was another devastating day, as 2,000 lives were lost upon America's entry into the war. The base was a place of death for tens of thousands of brave men and women who gave their lives for freedom's cause. The construction of the Pearl Harbor Monument in D.C. lasted three years, and opening day has finally arrived. Thousands flocked to the Capitol to view statues of soldiers raising the American flag, replicas of American battleships, and the centerpiece of the monument. A large peace fountain has that contained the names of every soldier known to have died in the Pearl Harbor attacks. Gardens were also planted in honor of the fallen soldiers, and it quickly became the site of mourning throughout the area. Flowers were left at the base of the fountain. Coins littered uh, the fountain floor. For the Americans who had no flowers to give, nor coins to donate, they gave the utmost respect for the fallen soldiers who perished in the face of destruction. Even a handful of exceptionally patriotic Americans claimed that America would have, would have her vengeance. No matter one's beliefs, tonight is a night of remembrance. And the rocket's red glare, the bombs bursting in air, we're going to go strike back the Japanese, I promise you that. Iberia offers assistance, though, in South Africa. This afternoon, the Iberian ambassador in D.C. met with the president. The Iberian ambassador, in a move that has shocked many in our administration, has pledged the direct support of Iberia into the South African War. The ambassador claimed that, should the U.S. accept the offer of Iberian support in the conflict, Iberia is prepared to contribute significant and direct military combat support. Although wholly unexpected, this news has been welcomed by many in Washington. Previously, many Americans felt alienated within the conflict. It has been widely viewed as if we were standing alone. While the scale of Iberian support has yet to be confirmed, we have confirmed or affirmed with the Iberian ambassador that we will accept their support without question. Furthermore, there are military poised to provide any aid possible to the Iberians in assisting with the commitments of their operations. We take all help that we can get. Oh my goodness. And now the DOJ begins investigation. Hopefully they don't muck it up. Today, the Department of Justice has announced that they are officially launching into a federal investigation of the wiretapping accusations, seeking to determine whether or not the claims are legitimate and whether President Nixon was involved. The support was nearly unanimous from the NPP's party, politicians, and constituents, as well as some of the President's more vocal critics within the Republican Democrat Party. Even the President has publicly praised the investigation, swearing up and down that it will exonerate him of the malicious and ill-founded rumors that have been haunting him for years, or really months. Privately, however, it is another story. The moment he got to his private office in room 180, he slammed the door behind him and bent into his staffers about how the investigation was a sham, or shame, a farce, a conspiracy to destroy everything he had accomplished. No group was safer from his invective than NPP, dirty traitors and the Republican Democrats, and the wiretappers for leaving so much evidence, Hoover for being sloppy and burying the evidence, alleged conspirators, or conspirators and the FBI in the White House, and everyone else who ever wronged him in his presidential career. Epithets like 
uh, ooh, Jew Bastarinos were invoked multiple times in the end. He made everyone in the office swear not to breathe a word of it to a living soul. <laughs> oh, man. This is... Oh. And they're all out together. And this is reminds me of Hitler. Like, if you ever seen Der Untergang or the, you know, the end, last days of German Reich, that movie, Der Untergang, that, that sounds exactly like what Hitler said and with that one scene. So, such a good movie, but I don't know. Just, ah. Oh. Oh, I don't know. Just, oh, my goodness. Ah. Oh. Nixon's going crazy. OFN Summit, uh, South Africa. Our armies have been able to hold off enemies just in time for the emergency summit to start. Thankfully, representatives from South Africa will be attending. With the summit, our leaders will plan a course for this war and discuss future South African participation. Once we finish, we will work havoc on all enemies of South Africa. Their freedom will be secured. Well, I think we've already done actually too much, so we're going to be staying the course, despite many calls from moderate factions to support a more balanced state of affairs in the Supreme Court. We've chosen to keep the current arrangements as they are. While we've not pushed to sack the court any further our way than it was already, the court will remain in the first present state, which some might call unbalanced for the foreseeable future. While party officials have emphasized the need for continuing reform as a reason for maintaining this current course, the media has predictably, predictably lambasted our lack of impartiality. As public content grows, there is great concern amongst our analysts that even though our mighty primary voters may gradually become disillusioned should we continue our first course. Our way or the highway? Good, and that's exactly what we want. Uh, buy back our arms, yeah, no. Ooh, ooh, look at the Rockies. Ah, South Africa, cool. Next up, oh, the South African Summit. So, the long-awaited date of the American-called Summit on the Policing Action of South Africa has arrived. The U.S. delegate gave a rather spirited speech on the necessity of the OFN to come together for this battle. Lest the organization fall, begin to fall to the wayside. Points were made that the unity pact's lack of cooperation led to the seeming death of Germany, and that Germany could never rely on a unified multinational military response like only the OFN could organize. A hint of fear was pushed as well as American delegates attempting to make a point that failure to answer this threat would lead to the threats coming to the members of the OFN. And my cat, Binky, just barged into my room. Hello, Bink. How are you? While McNamara's speech received applause by the Deputy Secretary Sticker and other representatives from the various governments in exile, some smaller so approval from Canada and Australia's delegates, with others seemed hesitant. Come on, Bink. Uh, let's see. The most telling response came from the representatives from the West Indies, Iceland, and Guyana, all whom have already voiced their disagreement with the war and their involvement. Oh, no. President... Poor Bergson of Iceland, the nation's first after the end of U.S. military occupation last year with the death of General Melly Jr., known for his fiery nationalist views, led the resistance to the proposal, arguing that the various puppet states to America have never had interest in American adventures, and decrying that they would never allow their blood to die on foreign soil, his own speech led to another round of applause from many other delegates. The decision will ultimately be up to vote, and many wait with bated breath whether the OFN will approve itself as an alliance or steel of steel or one of paper. We vote for victory. We're going to get more and more involved than we possibly can. And now we're going to do Friends of the Philippines. Yes, because actually there was a comment from yesterday saying that, you know, the Philippines don't like being occupied. I don't think anyone likes being occupied, but let's... In the submarine flight from the Philippines Islands, MacArthur had... General MacArthur had co-signed or consigned 80,000 American and Filipino soldiers to a forlorn hope in Corregidor Island. Only a fraction escaped the infamous death march, but they numbered enough to form a c capable nuclei for a quilt work of guerrilla bands spread across the old colony. The communiques... Communiques... Or communique? I'm sorry, I can't speak right now. The communiques they have declared since contact was reestablished contact spoke of nothing less than an important government ground down by both U.S. Army remnants and a homegrown communist insurgency. President Nixon had wasted no time granting the CIA a blank check for funneling supplies to America's stay-behind forces in its erstwhile colony. It is high time, he believes, that America rewards loyalty and restores hope by fulfilling an old man's promise. The Japanese will not be happy if they find out about this. Well, I don't really care. And luckily, they're not invading us yet, which is a good thing. It's only February, but I need a sip of my coffee. That is starting to get a little cool. Nice, nice, nice. All right, it is 64. Ooh, what can we do here? Helicopter stuff. We can't do any more. How about air doctrine? Let's do some air doctrine. Let's get some gun support for more ground attack. Thank you. And we're going to need some of this because we're already missing it. Hmm. Big sad. Alright, so what are we making here? One, two, three, four, five, five ish. We definitely need some military factories, so let's go build them up in Illinois. Very, very good. Oh, and Himmler is gone. Oh well. What's done is done. I'm really not too worried, but unfortunately, I will be right back. Alright, my apologies, my friends. I had to go use the restroom, but I'm glad I looked down here because, uh. What happened?
I thought we were defending this area, maybe, maybe not. But hey, at least we get back into action a little bit. Uh, so yeah. South Africa, we're actually doing too well. Ooh, Italy goes to war with Greece. Oh boy! And this, this actually pulls divisions away from the front line. So this will help make sure that the war continues on for quite a while, hopefully. As long as we don't lose, for now, and we keep the war effort high, an uninspired NPP campaign... <sighs> that sucks. And we got one more day, expand ground operations. We're not going to greatly expand it, though. Over here, I want to make sure that we have discontent with the war will rise even more. So, mm -hmm. invasion, supply, consumption goes down. More attacks, not bad. Rolling Thunder. Let's go with Chromanite. Eh, might as well. I don't really want to spend the pickle part, but I want public discontent to go even higher. That's my main concern here. Just get it higher, 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 higher. Oh, there goes Russia some more. I don't need to read about the domestic situation too much. Alright, just to get out of them, thank you. Just in case, go right there first, actually. And... Ooh, down the tubes. Nixon flipped through the channel, seeing what the nightly news stations were saying about him. Being discussed on all the big three networks would usually be a desirable thing, but seeing that the, what the cover of the Washington Post was that, that morning, he had a terrible sinking feeling. CBS Evening News with Walter Cronkite. The leak tapes, the president used several racial epithets to describe the investigation which he described as life-ending. The ABC Evening News with Ron Cochran. To Senator Goldwater's comments to the press this afternoon, I do not know... I do no, I know I do not speak alone for the Jewish people of America when I condemn the president's foul prejudice and above all else demeaning choice of words in the Huntley Brinkley report on NBC I have expressed concern for the state of the president with some going as far to call stone raving and unhinged the White House press secretary was unavailable for Nixon switched off the TV. Just as he had feared, it felt like everyone was trying to get, find a bone to pick with him, and they wouldn't rest until they torn down everything he accomplished during his presidency. As he stood up and walked back to his desk, he couldn't help but wonder how much of this was simply paying the price for his old sins. And how the hell did the Post even get those taps in the first place? Or tapes, or taps. There is such a thing as bad press. Yeah, yeah, oh yeah. Yeah, we don't need, we don't need to worry about that, so. Let's do the Rockies next if we can. I think that'll be fun. Yeah, we're, do we're, do we're doing too well right here. But look at that. 91 air XP. That's pretty darn nice. Immediately do the Rockies. This isn't good. Even though this is more like the House of Representatives. Up here is much more important. Even then. Like, we don't have Utah. It's a toss-up, so it's kind of okay. Next one after that will probably be the Southwest. Yeah, Southwest. Because we're showing a lot of support for the MPP all around. For now. <laughs> Because eventually we got to go back to the Republican Democrats. I want to elect the Republican Democrats in 1968 for presidency. So, but that's a little far off right now. Oh, and there goes the Greeks. Good job, Italy. Good job, the Welsh Revolution. Somewhat free, definitely Wales, and certainly an army. The Wen Hook Plan. Cool. We just got to get to May-ish, I think. Cool. 123 billion. A friend in the Philippines. The following document is designed secret 3.4. Fairfax has confirmed contact with the following Filipino rebel organizations. Pambansang Panglaya Kelusan, National Liberation Movement. Hukbalapaha, Anti-Japanese National Army. Bangsamoro, Islamic Liberation Front. Initial discussions with all are promising. Intelligence sharing with Fairfax is considered to be a priority in the stage in Boniface. Full intelligence sharing has not been forthcoming, but we are confident in our ability to tr build trust with sources. Fairfax can confirm that anti-Japanese actions on part of the multiple groups are extremely likely to be engaged in the future. Potential for the near future provision of weapons and financing is currently being evacuated by Fairfax. Looks like those rebels are going to get are going on the warpath. We lose a bit of money, whatever. I don't really care. So be it. Uh, the fighting Filipinos. That looks, sounds awesome. Protecting our interests. Uh, should we need to, our first material commitment in South Africa will make it easier to convince Americans to intervene. Uh, the Democrat, ooh, Democrat Republican Party grows a little more unified. That's not bad to have, actually. Looking to the reformer, influence in the partisans, military. Oh no, I want to influence the partisans in Indonesia. The Indonesian partisans are not united. Some of them will prefer a socialist Indonesia. Others among them are Islamic persuasion. Although neither of these are ideal, the socialists are much more aligned to our interests. As a result, they will receive some preferential treatment from Uncle Sam. When the time comes for the struggle, the socialists will surely then emerge as prime candidates for national leadership. Uh, and all we must do is wait. Because that's important. Maybe. I have no idea. I really have no idea. But I... I we can easily... Fairly easily get uh, a free Indonesia. We'll put it like that. We need to make more casts. We're, we're starting to run out. But you know what? 108 air XP. Not too bad. It is 64. Uh, Schmettler died last time. Oh, look at that! Schmettler's here! 
Through the, though the earth be moved, suddenly the whole harbor at Valdez begins to empty. It drains, almost dry. A subterranean chasm opens directly along the side of the ship. Uh oh. So the Chenna starts sinking down into it. Soon, only its mass can be seen from the top. The dock splinters, goes down with it, while crewmen try frantically to reach the people on it. No one on the dock at Valdez will survive. The longshoremen, the kids, or the dogs. As an earthquake struck south-central Alaska at 5.36 p.m. today for nearly five minutes, causing massive fissures that damaged roads and buildings across the state. Subsequent tidal waves brought further devastation to settlements along the southern coast. Reporting an epicenter near Prince William Sound, only 78 miles east of Alaska's largest city, initial analyses, or analyses from the U.S. Geological Survey indicate a magnitude of 9.2, stronger than San Francisco's in 1906. Governor William Egan has declared a state of emergency for the entirety of Alaska, mobilizing the state's National Guard to begin a national disaster relief in Anchorage and the port of Valdez. President Richard Nixon followed suit by directing the Navy and Coast Guard to conduct search and rescue operations along the coast. However, inclement weather conditions and damaged infrastructure may preclude more extensive release operations until Sunday at the latest. Total damage in Cal Streets from the earthquake are yet to be determined, though estimates are both are high. Alaskans are reportedly caught off guard due to the preparations for Good Friday, and events that an occurrence had left them with no time to react to either the tremors or the tsunami. Metropolitan Ambrose of the Orthodox Church in America has called for Alaskans of every faith and creed to treat their fellow Alaskan with a benefice worthy of our Lord God our, as we rebuild from the tragedy that struck this great and holy Friday. In five minutes, the devil swallowed our whole town. Oh boy, that is not bueno. And Issa talks revenge. As some across Alaska were sitting down to dinner, a sudden of series of tremors erupt, lasting for almost five minutes. After the dust had settled, over a hundred people lay dead in what we now know as the most powerful earthquake in North American history. In addition to the tremors themselves, the city has been racked by landslides, fissures and tsunamis, as well as the widespread destruction of rails, roads and railways. The rescue effort is gone going, with survivors and bodies being pulled from collapsed buildings in Anchorage. But emergency services, services were woefully unprepared for a disaster of this magnitude and to not have the resources to adequately deal with it. If we send disaster relief immediately, we will boost our political capital not only in Alaska, but across the nation as we prove that we are capable of protecting our citizens. Uncle Sam to the politically motivated rescue. Cool. And uh, that? Nope. Okay. Uh, we want... How's the... Uh, domestic situation is low. You gotta pump those numbers up, son. A vertical envelopment, nice. Send over guns, that's pretty small. I don't mind doing that one, maybe. Because it, it just will rise it a little bit. I want even more, 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 more discontent. And I know I shouldn't be spending political power, because I really don't want to, but let's get some air ground task forces. Nice. Nice. And the polls are updated. This happens every time, so if you want to read about the polls, go right ahead. But we're not, I'm not going to read it. And cooling down. And Italy's gone to war with Croatia now. So, embers have turned to ash in the north's largest cities. In Chicago, firefighters ended the last of the blazes that had consumed the west side, and the mayor suspended a curfew. In D.C., over 15 million in property damage has been accounted for. The order has largely been restored. Baltimore, where citizens' anger may burn the hottest, has concluded its extraordinary use of heavily, heavily armed federal troops. The protests and riots that broke out over President Nixon's use of the veto against civil rights legislation are slowly starting to die down, as a combination of apathy and repression slows their inertia. As the dust settles, historians and political scientists are examining the possibility that this outpouring of discontent marks the greatest social upheaval since the Civil War. Even as the violence on the streets is decreasing, rhetorical violence is increasing. Many civil rights moderates are outraged but afraid of what being tied to the rights by future electoral opponents. A broad swath of opposition from liberal Republicans to the NPP left are decrying Nixon as a tyrant envisioned by the founders. An open letter signed by a bevy of top ac academics castigated the Republican Party for failing or falling in line with segregationists and cast the veto as the ugly vow of the unholy union between the R and D. All signatories promised to leave the party and encourage others to do as well. It's clear that the veto of the Civil Rights Act has hardened its proponents and divided the country even further. What is it America has failed to hear? Cool. Civil rights, we don't need those. Awesome. And Kennedy shows his true colors. Uh-oh. Among the guiding principles of our nation is the belief that all men are equal before the law. And there is no one in our government, nor there should there be anyone, who considers himself immune to the very laws he swore to defend and uphold. This is not a matter of partisanship. This is a matter of democracy and dictatorship, of Americanism and anti-Americanism. Vice President Kennedy, are you insinuating that the investigation into the president for criminal activity is justified? I am saying that any question of wrongdoing on the president's part can only be answered in the court of law. If President Nixon is impeached and removed from office, how would you react? I would respect the decision of the Senate. Nixon grabbed the clicker and switched off the television with a grunt of frustration. He thought that Kennedy could smooth things over at the press conference. Instead, he all but admitted he was leaving his own president out to dry. Every day, it felt as if another prominent member of the administration was issuing some kind of veiled condemnation, hoping to save their own hides if he went down. Just like rats on a sinking ships. And rats, they most certainly are. Uh-oh. 
Looks like Cape Down might get invaded again. Ah, uh, well, looks like they didn't show up, though. Just in case, we're going to hang out here. Now, these guys are definitely struggling a little bit more since we stopped helping them out. But it's all part of the plan, my friends. All part of the plan. Civilian budget boost. Oh, we got to keep investing. A solid MPP campaign. Great. I'm going to get this a little bit warm. There we go. That's looking a little better now. That's looking pretty nice. So, one, two, three, four, almost five still. And we're making more stuff here. Oh, Dr. Strangelove. Ooh, there's a lot of events. So, when the movie came out, I had no idea what to make of it. Stanley Kubrick, directing a comedy? And a satire of nuclear Armageddon of that or of how a U.S. Air Force general gone completely insane and thinking the Japanese were destroying America from within by destroying precious bodily fluids with fluoride could order a nuclear strike on them? To American audiences, the thought that someone could just order a nuclear attack on a whim was something that only could happen from Germania, Tokyo, not in the good old USA. The flailing efforts to recall the bombers in the German revelation, uh, revelation of a doomsday device that would kill all life on Earth as bombers head for Japan just further confounds the audience's expectations. The movie showed that everyone from the unnamed yet all-powerful and raving Nazi Fuhrer and the over-ceremonial puppet of Japanese emperor were just as incompetent as any corrupt politician elected in the U.S., especially in the face of nuclear Armageddon. Yet Dr. Strangelove is much more than a surreal look at mid-20th century fears of nuclear war. It'll be recognized by future generations as a classic of filmmaking. Kubrick's obsessive attention to detail in everything from the camera work to the exact facial expressions of the actors on screen, the brilliant acting of Peter Sellers in three separate roles as the British emigre RCAF officer who tries to restrain the American general, the unready and soft-spoken president of the U.S. thrust into a diplomatic crisis, and the creepy and comedic Dr. Strangelove, a Russian scientist who has some crazy ideas of how to rebuild the U.S. in the aftermath of the now-inevitable nuclear war involving cross-breeding people with plants, the over-the-top and hammy actions of George C. Scott as he reveals just how the world was to end with American B-52s flying over the Canto Plains, with his arms stretched out and making sound effects with his mouth. The cowboy riding the bomb down like a bullet at a Texas rodeo to obliterate a Japanese military base. And finally, the montage montage of nuclear bombs exploding to the haunting, maybe, by the ink spots. It is perhaps the perfect dark comedy, funny in the face of terror, horrifying despite the levity. It brings in stark contrast the idea of mutually assured destruction to an audience that just didn't quite comprehend the fact that a nuclear war will be the last war. And it could all happen because of a mistake. From the Chicago Tribune, 1964. Gentlemen, you can't fight it in here. This is the war room. Or you can't film it in here. Hmm. Italian Empire, uh, mm, Italian Empire is going a little ham right now. Woo. Hmm. So many do Rockies. Mm -hmm. Four debuts of Monks. There's so many events, and I love it. But oh my goodness, this is why the campaigns for uh, TNO and regardless of who you play as takes forever. Uh, Southwest, eh, we we'll probably do Southwest next. So. Ford debuts a Mustang. In New York City, Ford astounded the world with what will be surely become an all-American classic. Sunlight gleamed room or gleamed from its long, shiny red hood. The frame that carried its sleek and svelte like a Hollywood prima donna. The chrome bumpers, her ritzy ringlets, necklaces, and earrings. Its cabins lay bare to the elements, as if it wished to show the world the velvet cushions that lined its seats. The silvers and ivories topping its every knob and handle. When the company salesman keyed its engine on, it purred like a docile house cat. When he stepped on the pedal, it roared with pride and darted around the track as a madman cheetah. Man-made cheetah, I should say. The crowd of hundreds has become tens of thousands, and eyes transfected the engineering marvel that graced the world's fair with its presence. They are greeted with numbers and features moments later. 3,000 pounds of treated steel. Rear wheel drive. Over 15 feet from bumper to bumper. Three speed manual transmission. V8 engines rated at under 200 horsepower. An Olympian in the shape of a car, yours for the low, low price of $23,068. Wow, that's not bad. Needless to say, the Mustang debuted with the city's worth of applause. That's really cool. I still can't afford that. Rockies. I do just do the Rockies? We might have. It really doesn't matter. We're just going to keep campaigning for funsies. As we get more and more air XP. 0.6 goes to 0.98. Uh, we literally must have just done the Rockies. Oh, okay. Uh, a Southwest, right? We want a Southwest. I can't remember, man. Sometimes my mind just goes, wee! So I should war public discontent if the war is low. And now we shall do the Fighting Filipinos. Ooh. Let's do that one. We can strike the match. Fighting Filipinos. The armed forces of the Far East announced its downfall not with a whimper, but with a defiant roar, hearkening to the revolutionary spirits of the Philippines' not too distant past. Rizal Bonifacio Aguinaldo. The condor and zeal with which an army of born warriors promised their oppressors due reckoning had lit flames or within every free man from Manila to New York. The words themselves struck chills into every turncoat's 
kyphotic backs, gritting in their silent moments of the doom they were owed. Laying the context of reported rumblings of activity from the mountains and jungles just this morning. Perhaps the Sig Sigga in Batan will resound a second time in the coming days. Further contact will be made. Entry 43. Some cop that it was a good idea to snoop behind the jalopy, so now my skull is split open like a watermelon. Well, not actually split open, but you know what I mean. At least I'm baked enough to shrug off the migraine a bit. Gotta ask Carlos where he hit his bud sometime. We're buddies, so it's no big deal, right? It's no fun grinding yourself in your own house because of an injury. Nothing to do but toke. Watch the little BS of the media shovels. Maybe getting around to finishing coursework. Just kidding. I haven't touched a textbook in a month. So just toke and just watch BS. Pretty much seeing your mug for a flash second before Cronkite plays his script about hooligans in the streets got old and thin quick. Eerie thought I should get a hobby. Why? I say, why bother? All I'm good at is smoking pot and giving myself a concussion for doing the decent thing. That and the army's out to hand me my papers any day now. What did... What do hobbies matter when a Nazi's bound to riddle my chest with lead either way? Can't understand her sometimes, honestly, but I guess that's part of her charm. Her helpfulness and sunny, bright outlook, I mean. In other news, problems coming up. I can either go stag or go with someone. Kidding again, who's a poor sap who want to partner up with some old poor me? But the food's free and all that matters. I'll probably just loiter around and leave as soon as I get my fill of the buffet line. Saving the dancing for the phonies, lucky enough to have a future. I'll write uh, more as soon as I find something new to talk about. Tomorrow, day after that, next acid trip, who knows? Peace out, Jules. <laughs> Jules, really? Really, son? Cool. Alright, anyways, let's see. Well, we're doing pretty well. We're doing better on APCs. Uh, yeah, we actually are doing quite better better APCs. A tanks, not so much. Anti-air equipment. We need to get these military factories done. Mil you know what? I could cut military spending again. Ooh, Penza. Okay, cool. Do that. You know what? We're... I want to improve the capabilities or the amount of output we have right now. It doesn't help us that much, honestly. So, well, we need more cash. Eh, but the dollar. The dollar, man. The dollar, what does it mean? And, the African adventure. Uh oh Nixon's staffers arrested. The men were let out of the state war Navy building in handcuffs by the FBI agents, trying their best to not look remorseful in the, in the front of the press's dozens of popping flashbulbs. Their charges had yet to be announced publicly, but few had any doubts of what they were what they were. Those who had violated federal wiretapping laws were invariably involved in the cover-up that followed. The press was less interested in what the crimes were committed, however, and more in who ordered them. They were all racing to answer that one question. How high up does it go? Nixon watched a parade from the room 180, silently fuming as the condemned were marched past the press and into a waiting police van. He knew Hoover could have dragged his feet and delayed the warrants if he wanted to, but he clearly had no interest in sticking by his president. Should have fired that bastard on day one, Nixon muttered to himself as the van sped off and the reporters dispersed. Pardoning them would could have worked, but that would require them to be tried and convicted first, not to mention burning away more goodwill than it's worth. Like all other messes bearing down upon him, Nixon would need allies and time to get out of this, and both were dangerously short supply. The noose tightened. Oh boy. That is not good for Tricky Deck. Cool. How is uh, Russia actually looking? Well, we got Novos and Beers doing pretty darn well. Kim Robo is looking pretty nice as well. Omalon is looking kind of thick. Amur is looking kind of long, boy, now. Uh, how about this here? Uh, it's looking okay. Signal Company's nice. Very nice. Wow, it's paused and it takes that long to get this up. Man, this game lags hard sometimes. Uh, let's see. Land Doctrine? We're still doing that. We can't do naval support because it's mutually exclusive. So, we'll grab some more artillery. Why not? Nice. War support is still low. Uh, let's see. Voting GUI. 27, 35. Oh, man, my goal is to get as much NPP support as possible right now. Iberia offers to at least Sao Tome. As the war in South Africa continues to ramp up, so does our involvement in the Iberian partners. The Iberians, much to our pleasure, have stood behind their commitments within the conflict, and have continued to provide much coveted support for our forces as well as those of our allies. In recent communications, the Iberians have pledged a significant expansion to their existing support within the war. The communication to DC outlines many intricacies and details of current Iberian intentions within the conflict, however, one pledge within the document stands out from the others. The Iberian island of Sao Tome, which rests just north of the equator, not far off from the coast of Central and West Africa, carries great potential as a logistics hub for the dur duration of the conflict. Following the establishment of Iberian operations in South Africa, they now believe the situation to be appropriate to lease access to the island to grant us. Uh, to us, granting us an invaluable logistical asset. Senior military officers or officials believe that the port of Sao Tome may be effectively used as a logistics waypoint and further as a possible airbase of our bomber aircraft fleet. Whilst plans for the usage of the island remain in the preliminary stages, we have gratefully accepted the Iberian lease proposal. And it's estimated that logistical operations on, upon the island will commence in a matter of mere months. There's no need. Uh, we'll lose some money, but you know what? Let's go and do that for now, because that, 
it gives us better, good relations with the uh, Iberians. Because they seem like they want to reform maybe a little bit, but we'll see what happens. Definitely see what happens. A stellar MPP campaign. Ampoles are updated. Great! Huzzah for the MPP. I just want to cut down the debt, man. That's all I want to do. Oh, we're getting attacked. Hey, I actually caught it this time. There is a division here. Kill them off. And they're dying immediately. You don't, dude, don't, don't even move. The planes are so fast. Oh, Brest is calling. I love Brest. From the general chaos of the former pact, a message from the Brest has reached us. The Breton Republic informs us they've broken free of German rule, and among their first tasks as a free nation, they've chosen to contact a number of leading world powers. The broadcasts are considered as mere declarations of independence for the international community, not as demands for the recognition of an independence for Brittany. Despite the chaotic situation in Germany, it remains to be seen if the Bretons can hold on to their newfound freedom. Congratulations, I suppose. The Fighting Filipinos. Cool. Strike the match. We'll see what happens. Beyond a, a forgotten Yog, Yog Yakarta alleyway, a haggard bar worker drags deep from a lit cigarette. With its glowing red and wispy gray tails, or trails, the smoldering ash looks like a small inferno set against the inky black sky. His other hand fingers a small package wrapped up in used newspaper. A bundle of wires protrude from a hole gouged out of Premier Sukarno's head. On a rice paddy outside Cebu City, a farmer wrapped in blood red cloth douses a bill of rice stalks with a lighter fuel. His eyes and full mood in between. Uh, empty Zippos. Tonight, a field of stars accompanies its wane light. His comrades are lucky this evening in a light, and a night this bright, even a blind man from hilltops miles away can spot a pillar of smoke. And in a derelict apartment in downtown Darwin, a plain cloth tunes her ham radio to an unused frequency. Her trained ears scour through the static for the ring or string of numbers that will set a thousand, I thousand, thousand islands alight. At the center for its open rebellion, we'll send a lot of guns to the Indonesians, even though technically we don't really need to. Like, we're going to do really well down there anyways. Let's see. Both parties are working well together. Mm, looking okay. Gods of the North, nothing but nonsense. Cool. We could increase party unity, but nah, we're good. Rocky's next. Domestic situation, the war is low. Discontent with the war is low for now. As long as it drags on for now, we'll be okay. You know what? Can we raise it higher? Screw it. Let's get it higher. Expound grand operations. That's uh, somewhat low. That's good. Yeah. Uh, increase it, increase it, increase it. Because we want to get rid of the Republican Democrats in op power. I know I I want. I said I need to save money or save political power, but that's what we do civil and spending for. So the right of boom. We can confirm that the blast of the Galley Theater killed at least 11 people and dozens more were injured. Most of the dead were local elites, business owners, city councilors, at least one congressman, and so forth. Langley contacted, uh, contacts and country have confirmed their supplies and cash helped in the operation. Nixon takes a long breath. He's gotten so used to business. It helps that the victims are just strangers, lying, mangled countless thousands of ways instead of just right in front of them. Robert McNamara pauses for just a moment, noticing the reaction, but continues. The police lockdown and bomb damage will also, will also screw with Manilians for quite a while, further building restraint further building resentments. Furthermore, our contacts are nothing are noting that the local Filipino papers are talking about Japanese security aid and economic enslavement. The overall effect is furthering the sentiment that the Philippines is a damaged vessel and not a free nation with its own right. Good. Is Langley recommending that we continue this program? They are indeed. I assumed as much. They have my authorization to carry on. Thank you, Mr. President. Now, on to the next item. Every fight for freedom has a butcher's bill. Our reserves are lose some money. Mene, mene, taka, ofarsin. Senators Johnson, Bennett, and Speaker of the House McCormick sat across the President Nixon in the Oval Office. The tension between the three congressmen so thick you could cut it with a knife. All three formalities had to be dealt with, so that all that remained was their assessment of how the upcoming impeachment trial would go. McCormick was the first to break the ice. The situation on Capitol Hill is, to put bluntly, sir, gloomy. Nixon's brow furrowed. Damn gloomy. Yes, sir, McCormick replied, not missing a beat. When the articles of impeachment are read before the House, there's no question as to which way the vote will go. As for the Senate... Johnson took over where McCormick left off. In the Senate, you'll need, what, 34 votes to quit? You'll probably get 12, maybe 15 if you're lucky. Even if I put the fear of God into every senator on the floor, you'll never hit 34. And which way would you gentlemen vote? Nixon asked the senators. They stared down at the floor, their signs betraying their intentions. For a brief moment, a male storm of rage seemed to brew behind Nixon's eyes, but it vanished as quickly as it appeared. The rest of the meeting was rather unremarkable, and the senators departed the White House in a swarm of journalists as into a swarm of journalists trying to glean a hint of what went on in there. Nixon, however, would not reveal his thoughts on the meeting until he sat down for dinner with his wife and daughters that night. Girls, we're moving back to California. Uh-oh. 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 This is what I've been waiting for. The end of the line? 
Nixon stared at the faces surrounding him in the East Room. Staffers, Secret Service, cooks, custodians, all of them having served his administration as loyally as they could for the past four years. He has decided to pontificate to them for a few minutes. At the very least, they can learn not to do what he did. And remember, he concluded, though your enemies may try to drag you down, never step down to their level. Never sink into your pettiness and spite. Never submerge yourself in hate, because once you do, they will triumph and you will destroy yourself. It's been an honor. Thank you. He stepped out of the East Room to a muted applause. With all the paperwork signed, and noon just seconds away, Nixon opened the doors to the South Lawn of the White House, holding it for Pat, Tricia, and Julie, followed by Johnson and Jackie Kennedy. The press, of course, turned out to revel in his dethronement. A final twist of the knife, but Nixon took it in stride. He wouldn't be there for him to kick off around much longer. At the stairway of Marine One, Nixon shook Kennedy's hand, simply saying, Keep her steady, Jack. He climbed the stairway, turned around for one last look at the White House. The staff, the guards, the reporters, the cameras. He, and he couldn't stop himself from smiling. He gave a wave and threw it up two V for Victory signs, chuckling at the fervent applause he got from the crowd. He then turned around and stepped onto Marine One and into history. He was soon borne away by the waves, lost in darkness and distance. I'm not going to select on this, though, right now, because, uh, right now, I want to get, ooh, we can't even get through this. Oh, you know what? We might as well just click it then, because we only have 15 days with it, don't we? 12 days. We have only 12 days. We're not going to be able to get this done, so. Ooh, here we go, my friends. This will unlock more national focuses. Hard Hat Rides break out of New York. Nixon resigns. The whole debate or debacle began when the group of college students decided to hold a demonstration in New York City. Or New York. Enough was enough, they said. America must leave South Africa immediately. War was good for absolutely nothing, but the pockets of death's business suited merchants, and neither rhetoric nor propaganda can sway their commitment to peace and love for all men. So with their long flowing hair and picket signs and slogans, they packed wall and broad streets by the thousands to profess their unconditional demands. The city's working men disagreed. Among the most vocal is Peter J. Brennan, president of an alliance of New York's largest construction engineering unions. To a man he and his fellow union men agreed, America had a more obligation to protect democracy from fascism encroachments, not just at home but also abroad. Dissent from the war effort was tantamount to treason. So with their hard hats, old glories, and steel-toed boots, 200 construction workers coalesced into a counter-protest in Federal Hall to profess their unconditional patriotism. All that kept a semblance of order was a thin, shaky border of policemen sandwiched between two raucous mobs. And when it broke, or open wide as does a gatekeeper when a bribe, order, had collapsed into bouts of naked assault. Hippies and hard hats brawled each other until they couldn't hit anymore, while a broad swath of New York lay sacrificed as collateral damage. It took the city two hours to rein both in, but by then, <clears throat> more than 70 people and untold millions in property damage had fallen victim to one of the worst riots since the Civil War. President Nixon is expected to make an announcement to, the, to uh, ameliorate ameliorate, I'm sorry, I can't read, tensions lingering from the hard hat riot, though whether or not can be succeed in doing so remains to be seen. How can one temper the spirit of millions? And I want to end today's episode with, ah, there's a focus stream. The Kennedy Presidency. After the resignation of Richard Milhouse Nixon, it appears that the Americans once again are able to look to a leader who inspires trust, hope, and confidence in uh, JFK. Having desired the presidency for many years, it appears Providence has done what JFK himself cannot. Cleared of wrongdoing in Nixon's scandals, Kennedy stands ready with the support of the nation to shape the U.S. into a truly greater and freer country. From civil rights to social programs, the Kennedy presidency is shaping up to be prosperous should it succeed in the upcoming presidential elections, which... Oh, look at... There's that smile. Look at... It. He's so happy. He's so happy. Oh, I'm so sorry what's, about, what's going to happen to you. But at the same time, we can probably send at least one more volunteer, right? Yes, we can. And they will accept. And now it's time... To actually get some uh, get some of the work done, get the job done. If that's the case, we're gonna come right here and just start zooming past things, and we'll end actually the episode very soon. You know what? This episode almost has gone on for an hour. Let's go through this one focus first, and then we'll call it an episode. Let's get over there quickly. Hopefully, they don't come back and beat us, bite us in the butt. And even with one division, we can do this. But you know what? Screw it. We'll do a cause for celebration. The Dirksen building had been quieter since Nixon's resignation, which was all the better for the brothers who now found themselves enjoying dinner once again. The now President Kennedy sat together with his, with his brother Robert, who still served faithfully as a chief of staff. I'm proud of you, you know. The circumstances aren't ideal, but I can think of no better man to be president right now. Robert could barely contain his adoring smile, thinking of all the things we can finally accomplish. Come on, Bobby. You're embarrassing me, chuckled John, who beamed nonetheless. But thank you. I know I can always count on you. Always. Like I'd, I'd, like I'd leave you for the NPP or anyone else, especially when you're about to give this country the change so it desperately deserves. Robert's enthusiasm, seemingly infectious, prompted more laughs from his brother. Now, now, we have a lot of work to get through before we can get this thing's emotion. He looked, his look became more serious and more determined. The party's image is somewhat tarnished at the moment with the Nixon fiasco, so I've arranged some trips across the country to shore up some support. At, at this, he reached into his pocket and pulled out a long itinerary of events and dates in various states and cities and handed it to Robert. Of course, we'll have to do the election to worry about. We have, we have that to worry about, you know, Robert Brown. Before reading, referring to a smile. Come on, Jack. 
I suppose we can just enjoy this meal before your big tour. You've earned it. And so the brothers sat for a while longer, enjoying their food in peace. As the time finally came for them to leave, Robert quickly glanced at the list and noticed, noted his brother's first destination. He smiled at his brother one last time before departing. I know you'll do great, Jack. I'll see you when you get back from Dallas. A fond farewell. Oh, man, that, that just breaks my heart immediately. But anyways, we got to end this today's episode there because we've gone on for about close to an hour. So, hope you enjoyed today's episode. We've gone all the way through to Nixon's resignation finally in its mid-64. But hope you enjoyed today's episode. If you did, consider leaving a like. Subscribe if you're new. Check out my Discord link in the description below. And I'll see you tomorrow when we will smash through all of Africa. Thanks for watching. Have a great rest of your day.